Hello True Believers, welcome to my series where I review every live action comic book movie. Now this channel is brand new and you may be like, man who are you? How dare you bestow upon yourself that you are worthy of this task? Well my name is Wizza and I am a huge comic book fan. And I also really love movies. Toward the end of my senior year in high school, I decided to watch every comic book movie over the summer before I went to college. So I started during my last few weeks of school and I realized I wanted to review them as well. And I went on YouTube and did a bunch of different searches, and no one has reviewed them all. Some people have ranked them all, such as Drunk Nerd, Sober Nerd, but they aren't really reviews, they're just a ranking with slight commentary on the movie. And I decided in that moment, I'll do it myself. So I started doing minute long reviews on TikTok, but I realized I actually wanted to go more in depth with my reviews because it doesn't give me enough time to talk about everything I enjoy and do not enjoy about them. And let me say, at times, some of these movies have little to nothing I enjoy. Just pain. A lot of pain. Now let me preface this by setting up some rules and I call them The Super 7. Oh, please don't cross that. The Super 7? What, you don't like it? I am by no means a professional critic. These are just my opinions and subjective analyses. Like seriously, I never even took theater when I was a kid, and I still wouldn't now. Number two, I am not an expert on everything surrounding comics. While I do read and watch a lot of videos on comics, it is impossible for me to know every single detail on every single character. I typically do a little bit of research beforehand, but some of the movies I review I will never have read a single comic series starring that character, but most of them I will have. Number three, these are just opinions. Just because I don't enjoy something and you do doesn't mean that you can't enjoy it. If you disagree with me, that's fine. Just politely type a comment and there's no need for toxicity. Number four, I gotta be really clear about this. This list came off of IMDB. It has over 100 movies listed, and if I miss one or two, please don't yell at me, because I have to go through a lot in the first place, and I'm watching one to two of these daily, and maybe one break between sometimes. I've even added some that weren't on the list to begin with, and just making it worse for myself. Number five, the requirements if you recommend a movie are that it must be live action, it has to have either been released theatrically or planned to be released theatrically, and the movie must be an adaptation of a character or story. So sorry, no TV movies. Now, honestly, I know that kind of sucks, but honestly, I don't have that kind of time. And while writing this, I'm still watching movies. So I might add theatrically released animated films just because I want to talk about Lego Batman and Into the Spider-Verse. I should probably have some dinner. Alfred left your lobster thermidor in the fridge. Oh, that's my favorite. I can't wait. So, you know, let's hope for the best. And number six, as we go through these movies, we'll discover what can make or break them and how things may work for one character, but maybe not another. Number seven, when I watch these movies, I will always try to keep three things in mind. The status of the world at the time of its release, the comic storylines that were being published, and what was going on within the companies and publishers at the time, because that is all really important. Okay, now that that's finally over with, let's get started with the 1966 Batman starring Adam West. <laughs> The plot of this movie is that Penguin, Riddler, Joker, and Catwoman have teamed up to kill Batman and Robin. Now let me note, I've only seen like half of the Batman TV series starring Adam West, but this movie I can't complain about. It's really goofy and funny and going back to watch it, this is a really nice break from the dark Batman we get now. Like seriously, he's always an edgelord. Remember, it's the 60s and I have to say this movie made me laugh a lot just because of how insane and goofy it is. If this came out today, there would be public outcry. I mean, G. Willikers, Batman. They're making us look like fools. The plot isn't even bad and the display is fitting for Batman in this era because it's early on before Frank Miller redefined him with The Dark Knight Returns. Batman does really silly stuff. He blows up rockets with quote unquote super energy waves and to this day I will continue to quote Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. 
The penguin literally dehydrates his goons to sneak them into the Batcave as dust, and then in the climax, they dehydrate the United Nations representatives. The Riddler shoots up rockets that Skywrite riddles. Also, can I just say, the Riddler has the tightest fit in this movie. I mean, I literally wish, like, he's still dressed like this. The fights are really nice, it's nothing like what we get today and you can clearly see Batman isn't hitting anyone, but what's behind the fights is what makes them so great. Seeing Batman fight as just Bruce Wayne and outwit criminals is a nice change of pace. He has to defend himself without his suit and gadgets. Batman at his core mostly uses his brain, so it's cool to see that on display. But it is weird seeing Joker not as a main villain calling the shots. He's kinda just in the back seat helping out the other like a sidekick almost and for this movie it actually works the penguin makes an excellent leader at times and it's cool seeing the villains fight back and forth for who's in control With criminal pride I'm afraid we're going to Mr. Be Riddler all right we must hang together almost assuredly we shall hang separately oh and what a pity that would be on the eve of the greatest criminal coup anyone ever dreamed of ah. Anyways, this movie is just a fun time. The antics and whack events that take place will have you pretty much laughing the entire time. The random explanation of Batman's dumb luck and long-winded dialogue from Adam West is really funny and how they solve Riddler's riddles are just perfect. I recommend you watch this one with friends. I wouldn't know what that's like because I don't have that many friends, but I bet it would be a great time. I think my points off are from the lack of development. It's a fun action comedy, but that doesn't mean we can't have some kind of story with our characters. But you know what? As a superhero movie, I'm going to give this one a 7 out of 10, but as a comedy, 10's across the board, baby. Comedic genius. Yes, I am quoting Cosmonaut Marcus from his Spider-Man reviews. Next on the list is the original Superman starring Christopher Reeve. Superman 1 is, in my opinion, the best Superman movie ever made. That's it. Wrap it up. Let's go. No need to review anything else. I'm just kidding. I, let's actually talk about this. This movie really defined the cinematic superhero genre. Batman was based in a long-running TV series, but Superman is the first of a new generation of movies, just like how he's the first in a new generation of storytelling. Y you see what I'm getting at here, you know? He was the first super anyways this movie is like a character study on superman i mean literally we go through the entire origin down to the last detail and honestly man is this movie fun now while personally superman has never been my favorite hero i still have done the homework that every comic book fan needs to do and i know a large amount about him and what he represents and means as a character and this is a good representation of what he is at his core this movie is your typical origin story and it does a good job in showing us who he is how he came to be and why he is the way he is. He isn't a god among humans, he's a human raised with the powers of a god, but I'm gonna get in that later. And I know many people will fight me for saying that, but you can sue me. Whatever, man. Throughout the beginning, we see he doesn't want to hide his powers and neither does his family. They know he's here to do something more than just exist. Like literally, they say it in the movie right before his dad dies. And there's one thing I do know, son, and that is you are here for a reason. I don't know whose reason, whatever the reason is, you know, maybe it's because, um I love that we get multiple chances just to see Superman simply saving people and doing the little things, which isn't something we get often in new superhero movies. However, this movie takes its time explaining his origin and a good chunk of it could have been cut out. It's not as bad as other movies though, that really like to take their time. I'm looking at you. You didn't have to be four hours long, we all know it. Anyways, a lot of scenes on Krypton in the beginning could have just been cut out or set as flashbacks in the other movies considering that there are three more after this because the next movie literally happens because of part of the intro involving Zod. So you could have just taken that scene, put it at the beginning, which they literally do, so it's just useless here, and it only really matters in the context of Superman 2. I also think Lex Luthor is a little bit misrepresented in this movie, but I can't speak on that a lot because I don't know much about Lex Luthor in early comics, but I prefer today's version more. He isn't trying to be a super genius criminal, he's just a genius with no morals whose purpose is to prove that humanity doesn't need Superman to rely on. Lex Luthor! The greatest criminal mind of our time. Of our time. 
I hereby serve notice. He's serving notice to you. That these walls, these walls here. Will you shut up, please? You're and his main motivation here is just real estate, which you know, does make more sense in realistic terms, but I think the modern version is a lot more introspective and cool, and even makes you think, huh, this guy's really got a point. All in all though, this is a solid Superman story, so I give it an 8 out of 10, a true masterpiece. Anyways, next is going to be Superman 2. Superman 2 is a good follow-up to Superman 1. I mean, go figure, they were released back to back and gave love and care to the movie. I have to say, while I think the previous one was better, this one still holds up. Superman 1 focuses on his origin, while Superman 2 focuses on Clark's struggle with balancing what he wants in life and his duties as Superman now that he's in the public eye. He's like, oh, I want to love Lois and be like in love and protect humans, and recorded messages of people from Krypton are like, no, no romance for you. Not a lot. I don't know, it's just kind of weird to me. Anyways, now personally, I think the damsel in distress act with Lois Lane is starting to feel a little overplayed. Thank God she's not in the next one. I still have to admit though that it was the 80s and there wasn't much they could do at the time. And Lois has always been a major part in Superman comics, so what are you gonna do? I think this is a good time to mention something though that bothers me, and it's the scene from Kill Bill. You know the one that I'm talking about. There's the superhero and there's the alter ego. Batman is actually Bruce Wayne, Spider-Man is actually Peter Parker. He has to put on a costume to become Spider-Man. Is in that characteristic, Superman stands alone. Superman didn't become Superman. Superman was born Superman. When Superman wakes up in the morning, he's Superman. His alter ego is Clark Kent. What Kent wears, the glasses, the business suit, that's the costume. Kent is how Superman views us. And what are the characteristics of Clark Kent? He's weak. He's unsure of himself. He's a coward. Clark Kent is Superman's critique on the whole human race. Hundreds of YouTubers have brought this up and I just want to make it clear where I stand on this. Now first, you shouldn't believe that guy anyway, he's the main villain, so why people quote him, I don't know, like the villain is the one who's supposed to be wrong, but people still bring it up. However, this movie brings a good argument to that. The loss of Superman's powers shows how strong he is. In this movie, when Clark Kent is reverted to regular old Clark Kent, he goes with Lois to a diner where they get into trouble and even as Clark Kent, he stands up as just a regular ass human being to be just a good person because that's what Clark Kent is. And even at the end, he comes back like a regular guy with his powers to teach him a lesson. Notice what I just said, he didn't come back as Superman, he came back as a regular old Clark Kent with the strength of Superman. You can do the math in your head. Regular old Clark Kent with the strength of Superman is a human with the powers of a god. He was raised on Earth, so he is raised like a human, but he has the powers of an, nearly an immortal being. It's, it, y you get where I'm going, right? So Clark Kent is not a portrayal of the human race as weak and timid. That is Clark Kent when he doesn't have to be Superman, a good person. Anyways, now that I've addressed that, let's get into the villains. I really love how Zod and Lex Luthor are portrayed in this movie. I mean, Zod is just a guy who is naturally evil and wants to rule the world, and that's always just fun in these movies. Like, I personally never see anything wrong with the character being just evil. Unlike other movies with Zod, it's shown early on that he's just evil, and he's not trying to just take out Superman to move forward with his conquest. He was just doing his conquest until he found out Superman was there. We'll get to see how this doesn't work later. Lex Luthor, on the other hand, just sees his opportunity to have more real estate than his plan before. I mean, who wouldn't want Australia? So why not take his chances with a good supervillain team up? It also really does set up his motivation for the fourth movie and how he's starting to just purely hate Superman. I also like the build up of Lois and Clark's relationship, but I think it would have been better if he decided that they could be together in the end without him having to lose his powers instead of the whole you know, he's gonna be Superman and not be with Lotus at all, and she just can't know anything. You know, it's kinda whack. 
Anyway, 7 out of 10, a good sequel. And next is Swamp Thing, starring Adrian Barbo. Now, Swamp Thing is the first movie you're gonna hear me not like. Now, even if I give a low number score, it doesn't mean I hate it. It just means there was so much wrong that it caused me physical and mental pain, but usually I have something good to say. Usually. I don't want to be pessimistic about these movies, but at times it's hard not to be when I really feel disappointed. Rarely will I not give movies praise where it's due, but let's actually get into this movie now. Personally, I always thought Swamp Thing would be better as a side character in things like Justice League Dark, which they did, and it was good, but years ago they tried to give him a solo movie anyway. This movie follows Agent Alice Cable as she tries to escape the swamp after a horrible incident occurs when Dr. Alice. Colin makes a major breakthrough on a government project they work for. I enjoyed the spin on the Swamp Thing origin, which I must say now I do not mind when they change things about characters or use them for a different purpose. I'm one of the few people that actually enjoy the Mandarin twist in Iron Man 3, so this works for me, but the way this movie presents itself isn't that great. A lot of character motivation and development is missing from this movie, which is odd because it may not seem like it, but Swamp Thing is a really complex character in comics, and he could have been explored more than what he is in this. We see early how Alec cares for the swamp and sees its beauty. It's nice we get to spend a fair amount of time viewing his perspective as Swamp Thing of a lot of the events, but I don't like the explanation as to why the formula turned him into Swamp Thing. It's more of an accident in the comics. Also, the buildup of the romance between Alex and Alec, Al Al Alice? Alice? Alice and Alec isn't developed that well. God dang. They just meet and then they're like, wow, we have so much chemistry. Compare this to Clark and Lois, where in the first movie, they get to have long personal moments together. Like a whole 20 minutes of the first movie was just them getting to know each other before the eventual conflict that separates them in Superman 2. The same goes for the villain Arcane. They show what he's capable of, but why does he care so much about this formula other than the slight implication early on he wants world domination like they literally mention it once and then never say anything else about it again and he just keeps trying to get the formula and thinks it's beautiful what it will turn him into and it just gets really weird because you really don't know what it's gonna turn you into and Swamp Thing barely explains what it's gonna turn him into this movie also has some really shoddy cinematography even for the late 80s this movie had a low budget though and had to be shot in a literal swamp so i guess i'll give it a pass i feel like this movie would have been a lot better if it was made later on oh wait we tried that yeah i'm gonna make you suffer with me as we remember the swamp thing tv show on the cw anyways i'm gonna give this one a good three out of ten a good try but you need some improvement now we're on to the lower of the Superman movies, Superman 3. I really like this movie though. This movie is summed up simply as Superman vs. Capitalism. This movie is actually really fun. I love that we finally got to take a step away from Lois and other characters in this movie and just focus on new characters without it seeming too forced. However, I think we could have done without another love interest, but it is cool to see her like Clark and not the other way around where Lois is in love with Superman. The addition of Richard Pryor as Gus is actually really just perfect. I love he's just accidentally really good with computers after being unemployed for nine months. I know it doesn't make any sense, but it does at the same time. People were trying to adjust to computers in the 80s and either you had it or you didn't. But the best part of this character is that we also see how conflicted he is throughout the story as he just wants to make money to survive because he's a victim of the system. But in order to do so, he has to tear down Super man, someone who just wants to do good. And this was a good opportunity to talk about a lot of issues during the time, and it leads to him becoming a huge help to Superman in the end. If I had to say one downside to this movie, it's the third act when Superman goes evil and does really evil things like fix the Leaning Tower of Pizza and get drunk and other things. 
It was cool to see a fight in his mind of his humanity and this evil godlike version of himself. And I think now whenever I get into an argument about if Superman is a god amongst men or human with the powers of a god, I'm going to keep saying that. I'm going to bring up this scene. He knows he could be above them all, but he loves living amongst humanity and they literally put it on the big screen. He's having an internal battle with his mind when the worst parts of him come out. And that's what makes him who he is. I should mention, I think this movie is really goofy like changing one component in kryptonite to tar turns superman evil also the final battle in this movie takes this movie from campy superhero fun to pure comic book insanity but it's still not terrible it's really weird though but it's not terrible anyways i'm gonna give this one a solid 6 out of 10 comedy gold next up is supergirl starring helen slater let's get this over with this movie is boring. The entire time this movie felt like it was missing scenes, which it was, because I looked it up and there was an entire 30 minutes cut from the movie before its release. In Superman, we get to explore his origin and background for a good part of the movie, but here we just drop in Supergirl with little to no explanation except for a quick scene on Argo City that sets up the plot. Whereas in Superman, we spend a lot of time getting to know him and explaining what makes him the way he is. Also, a lot of prior information that is known by the people of Argo City just doesn't get explained. Kara shows up and knows everything about Clark and his life, but it's never shown to us how they know, and I know it's explained how they're related, but it's never explained how they survived the destruction of Krypton or how this information is reaching them light years away. And honestly, as a person who reads comics, the comics don't even help you here because they change so many things. and you know you still need to mention these things for viewers that don't read comics at all anyways this movie continuously has you asking why things just happen and the movie goes on without letting you breathe or get a chance to understand its characters their motivations and their personalities oh here's a great moment to really develop the relationship between car and her lover boy oh wait time to fight selena again Oh, let's get to know her friends. Oh wait, here's a tractor carrying our love interest. Sorry, I just don't even remember his name. I feel every time we start to develop our characters, some random fight starts. I think it's good when movies give the audience a chance to breathe and understand our characters' internal conflicts, thoughts, and feelings, and how the external conflict or events change or affect that. Anyways, the villain has no motivation besides world domination, which I've said typically works for a villain, but in this case with Selina, the actress's performance is giving little to no life to the character, and instead makes you question why is she so evil, unlike a character like Zod, where the actress's performance is so insane, you just have to roll with it because it makes sense. Like yeah, this guy wants to rule the world. And some prior knowledge actually does give us some good reason, like how they tried to take over Krypton years ago. However, Helen Slater is trying her best to carry this movie on her back by giving some life to this movie. The moments we get with her alone are where I had hope for this movie. Like in the beginning when she's just flying around and experiencing the beauty of life on Earth was so nice and how she makes a difference between her and Superman with subtle things like flying with her arms out and feeling the world around her almost as if she's floating whereas Clark dashes forward as he's already experienced through the world and its life but her performance just wasn't enough to save it this movie left me feeling dry and empty and wanting it to be over with by the time I reached the third act I'm gonna give this one a 2 out of 10 just go watch Super Call the CW instead or don't it's not that big of a deal or an improvement. Okay, it's like 1 a.m. and I'm recording probably the lowest ranked movie on this list, which, you know, let's get to it. Um, what happens when you take a gag character and rewrite their entire personality and try to give them a solo movie? You get Howard the Duck. Did you know George Lucas, the same guy that directed and made the original trilogy of Star Wars and the prequels, produced this movie i this is this is this is guys i really don't even want to look at my script for this this movie is actually garbage this movie is hot garbage which i'm not gonna say often about movies because i always want to find a positive and i hate to be pessimistic and hate on movies because i just want to talk about movies and have a good time but this one this one just hurt to watch. I just want to find one positive here, and the only one I can find is that the soundtrack is actually really fire. Like, I'm not joking. This soundtrack is heat. Like, go listen to it.
I'm not kidding. This movie is literally insane though. The tone is terrible and switches constantly about what this movie is trying to be. Is this a comedy, a mature adult film, or a superhero movie because it honestly just tries to blend all of those elements together and more and I just really don't know what it is. And at first I was actually watching and I thought maybe I'm wrong, maybe this movie isn't terrible but then we hit the 15 minute mark where the villain is introduced and this movie decides to go batshit crazy. Howard the Duck is a gag character, which means he's not meant to be the main character. He's just kind of there to be funny or grouchy. I mean, he was literally introduced as a side character for the Man Thing comics. Out of every comic book character you could be attached to, you gotta be attached to Man Thing? Come on, dude. And I know he has a solo series, but lately he's back to just being a gag character. I mean, he even made a quick appearance in the MCU. They didn't even want to give him another movie. Now the voice actor here is really just not doing a good job for Howard, I'm just being honest. I've always kind of heard Howard as like a old guy with a grouchy voice, like Louis Black. Actually now that I think about it, somebody give me a Louis Black Howard the Duck movie featuring Rocket Raccoon. I think I would actually really enjoy that in the MCU. You know what? Yeah, some, if, if that ever happens, I, I want to copyright it, I called it first. Anyways. I honestly can't describe the dialogue in this movie. I like tongue in cheek lines like in Fast and Furious, but here the delivery just isn't great and I can't see the line between the jokes and the normal dialogue that's supposed to advance the plot because every line is just delivered awkwardly and doesn't fit. Also, I'm 99% sure the guy playing Phil only got his part because he could do a Donald Duck voice. <laughs> undoubtedly one of Earth's greatest minds here. Because his character is so insane and the tone switches so often, I can't really tell what he's supposed to be. Anyways, this one's gonna get the lowest ranking that will ever probably occur in this series and it's gonna be a 1 out of 10 and it will probably stay as the lowest ranked movie on this list. I have one thing to ask and that's why George Lucas, why would you do this? And if you really were paying attention, this is the first Marvel movie on the list. Not Captain America, not even Iron Man, not even Spider-Man got one before this guy. Howard the freaking Duck was the first Marvel movie to be made into a live action comic book adaptation. I can't do this anymore, just move on to the next movie. Okay, so uh, after doing Howard the Duck, I really almost had a mental breakdown, if you couldn't tell by the sound of my voice previously. Um, so there's like a break between, so if I sound different, I'm sorry. But uh, the next movie is not gonna make me feel any better. So I just watched Superman for The Quest for Peace, and this movie took everything from the past three movies and threw it out the window. I'm not joking, this movie is really painful to watch. This movie focuses on Superman's quest for peace, I mean go figure, that's the title of the movie. He decides to get rid of all the world's nuclear weapons, and yes that makes sense, but the way he comes to this conclusion is really ridiculous. There's a little kid in class after the US and Soviet Union announced they want to be the number one nuclear powers in the world, which may lead to nuclear war and fallout, and the kid's like, hey, you know what we should do? We should write to Superman and he'll get rid of all the nukes, and then they mail it to the Daily Planet, and Superman is so pressured by the media. He actually does it. Like beforehand he had a little bit of thought about doing it, but now he's like nah, I'm gonna do it. The worst thing is the Krypton files are just like you're not allowed to interfere with human history. But that's what's happened for the past three movies. I mean we mentioned it once in the first movie but you know, every single movie has pretty much been Superman interfering with human history. The first movie he literally stops the west coast from falling into the bottom of the ocean by turning back time. The second movie he stops world domination but honestly that was Krypton's fault for not killing them in the first place. So I guess that's kind of a pass. But the third one he literally stopped one of the largest oil crises in history as well as a mass weather plot in the beginning half. I don't know it just doesn't make any sense. This movie feels like it's missing scenes, which it is because there's an entire 45 minutes missing from this movie. Every character feels like a cardboard cutout of themselves and all the love and care for this movie just disappeared from the entire cast and crew. Christopher Reeves wrote in his biography that filming this one was far different from all the other movies and less 
on-site shooting and more in the movie lots, which took a lot of heart and soul away from this movie. The only person trying here is Lex Luthor, and for the first time his motivation is more than real estate, and he genuinely just wants to get rid of Superman, albeit so he can be a nuclear arms dealer, but you know, whatever, I'll take anything at this point. Did you know there was supposed to be another entire nuclear man in this movie? The writing and editing couldn't be worse, every line feels pointless and there were times where I thought I had just cut away from a scene without letting it finish and I had to go back and check to make sure I hadn't just zoned out. Similar to Supergirl, this movie continuously has you asking why because during the second half of the movie it just stops explaining things and every scene is only 2 minutes long without us actually giving any development to our characters. Lex Luthor escapes prison and just starts making plans, then Nuclear Man is introduced once Superman throws his nuclear into the sun which was really messy then he gets scratched and catches a cold and that makes him feel bad he had a nice chat with lois and saves the day i know it sounds less like a review and more like a retelling of the story and that's because that's all that happens in this movie superman just is kind of lackadaisically doing things and there's no real conflict here he just beats up nuclear man beats him up again and then the movie is over i don't know i think they were just ready to stop making these movies i give this one a two out of ten holy shit can we just get to batman already anyways next is the freaking punisher okay sorry i had to actually take a, another break because i was starting to lose it um but i'm better now and uh yeah i forgot that this challenge will force me to watch a lot of movies that aren't going to be great but luckily this one isn't that bad and this next one isn't going to be much of a review and more just like a quick little this this one would be pretty quick so it's punisher time and i gotta say this one kind of surprised me it wasn't amazing or anything but it wasn't bad like the last few movies the punisher isn't exactly the punisher however they more so just use the frank castle name and tweak the origin like he's not even a marine he's just a police officer which sets up actually a nice emotional point later with his ex-partner and it was actually kind of nice i don't know i liked it I also really appreciate that we don't get the misrepresentation like we do today, where the Punisher has become a symbol for police and military to look up to, but also I wish they did incorporate the true origin which is supposed to show how corrupt police and government can be, and that this isn't someone you should look up to, and if you don't believe me, look up any interview from the creator himself, he said this multiple times and there have been stories that explore this, however I understand the lack of origin because at this point Punisher had just gotten a solo series and many fans were familiar with this origin except there is one scene at the end that is somewhat of a character assassination basically the punisher is sitting down with the mob boss's kid after killing his father and the kid points the gun at him and threatens to kill him I expect Punisher to look at the kid and tell him he doesn't have to do this and that he can be better than his father and lead a good life, and try to relate to the fact that he was a father once and he knows that he is a bad guy for killing so many. Like in comics, he knows that his way of justice is quick and easy, but that doesn't always make it right. He's just willing to go a step further and be judge, jury, and executioner, but instead, he actually encourages him to do it and kill him, and when the kid doesn't, he doesn't say something like, oh don't be like your father he just says like good because if you end up like him i'm gonna come after you next anyways this movie plays out like a comic book storyline it's campy and goofy with some okay action but the story is coherent and the dialogue actually isn't terrible however dolph lindgren's delivery of the few times punisher talks is really awkward and forced but he still has some pretty badass lines i enjoyed that there's no love interest in this one and it really gives us time to focus on Punisher without someone else getting in the way or being underdeveloped. It's just a fun action movie starring Frank Castle. I wish he was actually wearing the Punisher symbol in this one. The only reason I don't bring up the exploration of PTSD is because we already got that in the new Punisher show, which I really like, but the movie has nothing more to say or explore with the meaning of the Punisher when it has a good opportunity to. So I give this one a 5 out of 10, the first average superhero movie. Alright true believers, we've made it. We are at the final movie of this video and it is one of my favorite superhero movies. I'm not even going to waste any more time. This movie is awesome. Batman 1989 starring Michael Keaton directed by Tim Burton. 
This is the first near perfect superhero film since Superman 1. I know my shit when it comes to Batman and this is a good portrayal even though he's barely the main character of this movie. Call me a Batman fanatic but this movie is fun. Jack Nicholson's performance as Joker steals the show. I mean literally he has more screen time than Batman himself. Joker is so insane and fun to watch. We dive into his psychology and see how normal people define his mental disorder but when Joker explains it himself, he puts it simply as him finally being able to show his true self and how society has been holding him back, but I'm glad society really holds people back if this is what some of y'all would be if it wasn't for societal expectations. Because god damn. But let's get into other characters. Gotham in this movie is its own character. It feels like a living, breathing city. It looks like a big city, but at the same time, a really shitty place to live in. And honestly, that's how Gotham should be. Kinda like New York if I'm being honest, trust me I know, I've been there plenty of times, and it's really brought to life by the abundance of people and interesting architecture. The dialogue is perfect and almost every line from Joker or Batman can be considered iconic. I'm not going to kill you, I want you to do me a favor, I want you to tell all your friends about me. What are you? I'm Batman. <laughs> The action is exciting and fun and it's nice to see him use his gadgets in interesting ways. They're like a tool and they're trying to push the limits of what they could do at this time. I don't even mind the tweaks to Batman and Joker's origin. I prefer the Joker without a name, but here I don't mind it. It makes sense and it isn't much of a bother. It's cool to see how they're kind of linked together in the end and they created each other. But I still think one of the coolest parts of Joker is that no one will ever know who he is. But this movie kept me engaged the entire time. The only thing that knocks this movie down is that we don't really get to know Batman besides his motivations and quest. I know we're all tired of seeing the origin over and over, but we gotta think about this. This was the first Batman movie since the 60s. The animated series wasn't out yet and in fact was created because of this movie. This was the first real big blockbuster movie starring Batman. We spent a bunch of time with Joker's origin, but not enough with Batman's. This one plays it subtle and almost a little too too subtle, though at the time Batman was at one of his peaks in the comic book fandom so it makes sense but it would have been nice. Also I wish we took a deeper dive into the struggle of Batman trying to be Bruce Wayne. The only time we see a bit of that struggle is between him maintaining his secret identity and life as Bruce Wayne is with Vicky Vale. I also like that Vicky Vale isn't a damsel in distress like Lois and more of a femme fatale and there's a reason why she's put into danger due to Joker's infatuation with her instead of just by coincidence. In total, this movie just takes everything good from the movies we've watched beforehand and merges them into one of the best Batman films ever made. That's something I'm glad we get to see. Directors should always look at what came before and use those elements to craft a better movie and improve upon the genre. So 8 out of 10, please let Batman turn his head. It makes him look goofy. Anyways, thanks for watching and listening to me. I don't know how long it's going to take for the next video, but the next one is going to be all about the 90s. Because, well, you'll just have to wait and find out. I hope you enjoyed, so click that like button and maybe even subscribe. I know that sounds really stereotypical, but... You know, I just kind of started, so I kind of got to, you know, get, get those things. So, you know. Anyways, if you want to argue with me or even talk about comics and movies with me and just tell me your opinions on these movies, you can leave a comment down below or you can follow me on Twitter and I'll link that down below. It's going to be a long journey, my friends. And always remember, true believers, I'll see you next time. Excelsior!